Okay, yeah, so we'll be looking at three different understudy communities, and I'm very happy to have a co-presenter with me today, Zach Cooper, who will be coming up for the second half of our presentation. He's one of our Dartmouth students who's now graduated and, and is working on other topics, and he did a lot of the research on the Native American communities in this study as a cultural insider, so it'll be really, it's a really wonderful opportunity to get his insider perspectives on that. So I'll spend, I'll spend some time talking about the first two topics here, and then the second half of the talk will be about the Native American communities, since Zach flew all the way in from Arizona to help us out with that. So we'll be talking about uh, tone in the Sui communities of China, and then Hmong American communities, an effect of increased pitch and intensity, like a style shift or register change, and then Native American communities, some intonation patterns that we've been looking at over at Dartmouth and other places. Is the sound level okay? Let me know if I get too loud, I get overexcited. Okay, so the Sui people of Southwest China are, are, have a lot of small clan-based villages, and it's an indigenous minority of rural Guizhou province. It's a Taikadai language, it's tonal, isolating, largely monosyllabic. From a, I'm a sociolinguist, from a sociolinguistics point of view, what's amazingly fascinating about this language community is that there are multiple, mutually, mutually intelligible clan dialects and there's a lot of mixing socially and linguistically because of inter-clan contact in marriage. So no clan lect is considered more prestigious than another. But what happens is when you get married, the women are expected to leave their home clan and move to the husband's village. And actually, I need to talk to Emiliana Cruz about this later to see what kind of comparison might be happening with Chatino in terms of cross-marriage uh, linguistic effects. But unlike linguistic exogamy, it's not that you need to marry someone from another language family, but you just you marry someone from a different clan, and it so happens that often there are different dialect features involved. So in one case, we in, in one village of 150 people, we, we counted women representing 19 clans in that one village. So it makes you think of fieldwork being a very complex activity to try to figure out what's happening in a village with that kind of level of complexity. But actually what we find is that for each village, there's a local patrilect, kind of the social construct of, of a patrilect, the, 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 the dialect of the, of the fathers, the teenagers, and any unmarried women. And everyone has the same surname except the women who married into the village. And they can even identify people based on their surname. As soon as they say the surname, they say, oh, well, I know what first person pronoun they'll use. I know what kind of tones they're going to use, just based on the person's surname before they even talk. So, here's, here, so I've translated these things in, into, from Sui to English. Here's what one person said. Our clan ideology is strong. Even though a woman marries into another place, she is still a member of her father's place. Because her people, people back in her father's place speak this kind of dialect, she continues on. So I wanted to look at that in more detail. And there is a very strong social component to this because the clan ideology connects with land and property rights and interpersonal obligations. So here are just a few examples of some of the dialect features. It could be in terms of pronouns. It could be lexical items. It could also be a, a number of phonological changes, especially tone, which is the one I'll talk about today. So here's another quote, another one translated from Sui to English. I asked this person, so you've been living in Lyon a long time. Have you changed your speaking? So this woman had been married for 20 years, and she moved into this village. She said, no, not even a single word. The Zong surname people don't speak like the Pan surname people. If a mother is a pawn person, she won't speak the same as her husband and children. And I asked another woman who'd been married for 10 years in this village, and she said, well, this village here, those are the Lu people, so they say A for first signal. We are the Pan people, so we say you. Each surname speaks its own way. The Lu people speak like the Lu region. We Pan people speak like Pan people. And, and she looked like I was crazy to even think that you might actually change as you, after you've been there for 10 years. So it's just a very clear uh, pattern that you, you use the dialect of your father of your home village where your family was. Another person said, oh, if someone from the Pan surname came to Lyon and spoke like Lyon, everyone would laugh. She'd feel embarrassed, and she wouldn't speak that way anymore. In Sui country, we always say this. You are from your own home. Your mother raised you. If you go to another home and speak like them, you'll feel embarrassed. So I wanted to see what's happening linguistically to see how, this, how, how, this, how these social perspectives match up with what we could record. And so I looked at two different clans, a North clan and a South clan. I looked at women who'd married from one to the other, and then the women who'd married from the other one to back to the other one. And then also has sort of a baseline looked at men and teenagers in those two villages who hadn't moved. And then some additional recordings in a village in between where we had 150 people and we recorded about a third of the village in the end. Different personal interactions, village gatherings, family meals, and married women from seven different clans. And basically what we found is that people really were staying very close to their original home clan dialect, so the, the dialect of the father. Here are the lexical results, and basically whether, so for the Zong people, whether they were in the Zong village now, or if they'd married out 10 years ago and living in the Pan area, they were 100% accurate as far as using the dialect features of, of their original home village. But when we look at lesser studied languages, we also run into lesser studied variables, which is why I picked this one to talk about here at this ETAP conference. One of those is sociotonetics. So tone 
is, a, is something that we study often in linguistics, but from a sociotonetic point of view, the idea would be to look at for variation and also then to correlate it with social factors. So here are two tone inventories of these two different clans that I'm talking about. And the main thing I'll focus on today is just this red tone, which is tone six. It's, it's a low rising tone in the one community, so it's nigh. In the other community, it's a high tone, nigh. And so I wanted to see what happened with that tone after these women who had married for, tw for 10 years and had married into the husband's village. So here are the baseline speakers. So each, each line represents the mean of all the tokens of tone six words for a single person. That's what each line is. And so it's the north group versus the south group. So you can see there's, there's a, a big difference in those tones. Then these green lines are the women who were raised in the high tone region. They've been living in that low tone region for 10 years or more. And as you can see, they're continuing to use the original tone, the, uh, the high tone nigh of their original home region. And you can also look at this at the, this is looking at the 90% of the syllable duration, just to, to look at it statistically and to show that they're continuing to maintain the, the tone features of their home dialect. That was in a speech style that we called a flexible phraseless style where they were, they were discussing things like a bottle, but just making a little phrase around it so that I get kind of a, 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 a moment of prominence that I could use to measure that. Because within sociolinguistics, we're always looking for the most natural speech style possible. With tone, it's a bit tricky because if you use just plain old connected speech, I don't need to tell this to an audience of you know, experts on prosody and phonology, you get declination patterns so that the same tone too is much lower than it is up there. So for, for, that, for that previous slide, the way I did it was to have them kind of use a, a, a prominent moment when they'd say, like, this is a bottle. And that worked out quite well to isolate the tones a bit. But I also wanted to see what's happening in free speech, though, because what if, it, what if they're just doing that for me because I'm giving them kind of a formal style? And so I played around with a, a bunch of different possible ways to use tones in free speech, because within sociophonetics, we use all kinds of free speech data for vowels. If you're, if you're studying the Northern City Shift, we look at lots of natural speech and we can just pull out the vowels. With tone, it's a bit tricky because of things like declination and adjacency effects. So I played around with a bunch of different methods and I found a way that was reasonably good and it, and it does produce the same effect where you have a clear contrast between the two, two different clans and here's a linear mixed effects analysis, but basically showing that the women who'd married into the opposite village maintain their dialect features in terms of this tone uh, to, uh, so there's no statistical difference between the two different groups within the two different groups, but there are differences between the two groups. So basically we found that the North Clan women maintain their original features despite 10 years or more in the South Village and the South Clan women opposite direction as well. But looking at other research on dialect contact and mobility, this is actually kind of an unusual result. So in Siegel's summary of dialect acquisition, this was actually one of the only studies where there wasn't significant change. They looked at a bunch of other variables as beyond tone. And so, but more typically what you find is, as Chambers is saying, your dialectologists have always been aware that mobility is a potent force in leveling. In this case, though, it doesn't seem to be such a, such a, I mean, so we all know that as you go to a different place, you're likely to adjust your speech a little bit, maybe in some features, we never 100% acquire another dialect. But also in all these prior studies, they find evidence that people have changed a little bit. Whereas in the case of Sui, for all the variables we've ever been able to find, they were maintaining their home dialects. And so clearly there's some kind of very strong social component involved. And one way of looking at that would be to say that you have these linguistic features associated with one of the clans, and then you take your social identity as a member of that clan, and then you're, you're constructing and reflecting that clan dialect each time you speak. Then if you get a large set of people, each one of those, each one of those speakers is then also producing and reproducing the clan lect each time they speak, which is not unlike what we might talk about in terms of gender. In fact, I was talking to Lal Zim Zimmon about this study, and he was pointing out that in many ways these clan identities could be a, there'd be a parallel with the way we think of gender and gendered language use. There's every time you speak in a certain way, you're producing and reproducing that gender identity. So here's another interview question I said, what if someone, spoke, what if someone like you spoke the local dialect? This woman had married for 40 years outside of her home village, and she said, they would always laugh, so that person wouldn't talk like that anymore. People would laugh and they'd say, you don't speak like your own place anymore. You ate the food of our place as a child, so you should speak like our place. And this was a really cool idiom that came up again and again. You ate the food of our place, and it seemed to be identifying a person with their home village. That that's, that's, those are the people that, that gave the resources and raised you, and you should speak like them for the rest of your life. But this raises the question about children, though. What might be happening with children in these homes with mixed dialects? Here's what someone said about the children. They said, if a child speaks like her mother, the people in our village will laugh at her. 
they'd say that the child isn't a member of this village, then the child would feel very brokenhearted. So that same social expectation is placed upon the kids as well. So here's a 10-year-old child in the region where you have the low rising nye, the red tone there that I'm talking about. Here would be her mother's variety, and here's her father's variety. So by the age of 10, she had acquired her father's low tone nye, unlike the mother nye. Here's a 10-year-old boy, same thing. He's being raised in a region that is, that's his father's variety with this low tone there, and his mother has the high tone. So by 10 years old, it's pretty well established, but I wanted to see what would happen in the younger ages, and we, we find some variability. So here's a three-year-old girl. This girl, so looking again, looking at the red tone, she is kind of in between the two. Here's in between the two. Here's her mother's variety. At three years old, she was in between the two. And when you split that apart, you can see what's happening there. For some reason, she's learned to say the word monkey like her mother, but she says the word fish like her father, and chopsticks is somewhere in between. So that's happening uh, along that way. So and we get a lot of metalinguistic commentary when we discuss this with, uh, with, with members of the village. So one phrase that com kept coming up a lot was to say, which means don't be like your mother, be like your father. It was kind of a set phrase that's out there. So you can see kind of some of the, the social expectations that are put upon these kids. So again, so what I find in this Sui situation seems to be something like this, where each person, every time they speak, they're reflecting and constructing their, their identity with that clan. So that then you can have multiple clan licks right next door to each other, literally, or sometimes within the same home. You have this because the mother is speaking differently than a three or four year old kid but because each person is constructing their identity continually, the system is maintained. Okay, so that's a, that's a story of Sui, a brief overview of that with lexical tone. Now I'll look at Hmong American communities, where we find a speech style with increased pitch and intensity, and my co-author on this is, is Mai Yuamua, who was at McAllister College, and what she noticed was, so she's, she's a Hmong American and a, and a speaker of the language, and she noticed that there was a sort of authoritative voice which, or something like a lecturing style that she noticed the older generation would shift into sometimes in certain settings. And we wanted to see what were those settings and what are the acoustic correlates of that. So Hmong Americans have ancestral origins in China, followed by migration to Southeast Asia, and then a large number of Hmong refugees left Laos and Thailand following the Vietnam War. So we have like 186,000 Hmong in the US now. It's a clan-based traditional society with lots of migration and dramatic social changes happening. So in terms of things, uh, genres or registers that might be called an authoritative voice, uh, some of the prior work includes Hicks Kennard, who looked at Marine Corps drill sergeants, and she found that there was a higher pitch for the command voice. And then also some gender defects, women seem to have longer vowel duration. Then looking at a Zapotec language, Sikoli found the opposite, that low pitch was used to indicate authority in that community. And then for the present study, we found for Hmong, the correlates were higher pitch, greater pitch variance, higher intensity, and it was used by the older men, and it seemed to have this uh, meaning of asserting traditional cultural roles authority, especially male roles in the home. So the interviewer was Mayu Muos, who was 22 years old at the time, and the idea was, it was sort of an experiment. We'd say, the interviewer is controlled, it's one person, and then she interviewed these four different groups of older women, older men, younger women, and younger men. And we just wanted to see, because we were aware that there was this sort of lecturing voice that would, that, would, that would happen in the community. We wanted to see what would trigger it, which groups would, would use that with her, and what kind of discourse context might trigger it, and what are the acoustic effects of that. And basically, it was the older men. So here's, this is the, <laughs> this is the group that used the, the authoritative voice style. And the older women did not use it. The, older men, the younger men and women did not use it and then a couple of the older men did not use it. So Mayu Mua's instincts were correct that it's something that the older men are using. Acoustically, we find a statistically significant difference for each of the speakers with uh, the authoritative style having higher mean F0 for each speaker statistically significant amount. And then pitch is often correlated with intensity and it was here as well. So the authoritative style had a greater intensity. And basically I just had her mark when the lecture, I mean I don't speak, I, I speak Sui but I don't speak Hmong and I just had her mark in the recordings when this lecturing voice started and then I went in and analyzed it and found that and we also found that the variance was higher. So that's one aspect of it. Maybe there's other things we need to look at like rhythm patterns or something, but definitely pitch and intensity were a big effect. Then we wanted to see what is it in the, dis what is the meaning of this? What, what's causing it to change? I won't read this whole thing, but basically this is an older man talking about uh, the, the homeland and, and now he's saying that the, the youth who grew up in the US and are educated have changed tremendously 
And then he shifts to authoritative voice and says, we brought you here to this country because we want you to become educated and be able to liberate us from hardship and the old ways and gear us for new knowledge. So he begins to tell her what he wants her to know about this new life in the US. Here's another one, I won't read the whole thing, but he's saying, he's talking about Hmong culture and some of the traditions and the ancestors. And then he says, we as Hmong have and share a culture that's been with the Hmong community for centuries, not something that's just been generated. So it's, it's often about nationhood and also often about traditional roles, especially gender roles. So in summary with this, what we find is a, a higher pitch, a greater intensity, greater variance, and it tends, when we had one young woman interview older women, older men, younger women, and younger men, we found the style was only used by the older men, and it seemed, the shift seemed to happen in the context of wanting to tell this younger generation about nationhood, among traditions and adaptations, and assertions of men's traditional status. So it would be very interesting to follow this up with a study that had a, a young man as the interviewer. We don't know if it would get the same effects, but probably we would. And then concern for the younger generation and the future of the community. Okay, if Zach can come on up. So those are the first two studies looking at lexical tone and increased pitch and intensity with the authoritative voice. And then now we're gonna look at Native American communities intonation patterns. And this is a study that we did at Dartmouth a few years ago. It was started with um, a couple of Native American students, Kalina Newmark and Nicole Walker, and then Zach Cooper came on board just a couple years later and then did continue with a lot more research as well. And basically what happens was these students were pointing out that there's, there's an affinity house called the Native American house, and they were pointing out that when they were in the house, they noticed different intonation patterns than when they were in the classroom or when they were talking to me. There, would be, there wouldn't be those patterns, but in the house they found those things. And this, as a sociolinguist, that's like a red flag to say this is something that needs to be studied. It sounds like the social construction of ethnic identity, and it seems to be. And Dartmouth is a good place to study this because it, there's, a, there's a long history of, of involved with Native peoples, and they, they work hard to recruit a lot of Native students. In fact, we're, they say that we have more Native students at Dartmouth than all the other Ivy League schools combined because of that effort of, of recruiting that happens. Still not very many, but, but much more than other places. So the idea is to say that you know, we're, we're acknowledging that language both reflects and constructs Native identities along multiple dimensions. Not everyone's gonna use language. Not everyone will use these features. They might not even identify as Native, or if they do, they might not use language in that way. But many people do. And as the students talked to us, that what they pointed out was you know, we're dealing through, with, the, with these generations, we're dealing with the changes in vitality of litigious languages, so issues of language revitalization. But at the same time, they would say, yeah, but you know, we also, we also create an identity with English. They kept bringing that up, saying, yeah, but don't forget that we also speak English, and we have these, they, they just had the sense that there were some things they were using to create that identity, and so that's what we wanted to explore. So William Leap has a nice book on this topic in general, mainly focused on, on grammatical features. There have been a number of really nice studies looked at particular tribes and regions, often focused kind of on regional English effects. But what we wanted to do was to say, is it possible that there are some shared prosodic features across wider distances? And Elizabeth Cogshell had a nice study looking at timing, and she wondered if that might be the case too. And we wanted to look at diverse tribes and geographic regions and see is there something that's shared across these regions that people recognize? Not that everyone uses it or not, but, that there, but it might be something that's recognized, maybe used as a second order indexical in the sense of Silverstein, that people are aware of it and can use it for social work. As far as historical origins, it could go back to the boarding school era. That's a possibility. There, there's a possibility of, of tonal substrate languages being involved. But we're actually looking at a synchronic perspective, more recent spreading through contact, through powwows, and in particular, we're looking at just the current usage in modern Native America. What is happening with this feature? Are there similar features across the US? And what might those things be? And so this is primarily a sociolinguistic study. And we have some, some prosodic um, descriptions or possibilities. But with this audience, I'm hoping that you may be able to give us a deeper prosodic analysis of what, what some of these patterns might actually be. So then I'll turn it over to Zach. Yat e, she is a cooper yenishe, tlas chit and nishle, eja ogi bashachin, kiss ani johanna e dashache, katsogi dashanale. Hello everyone, my name is Zach Cooper, I'm a Skogi Creek, Dana and Hopi, and I'm going to be speaking to you today more about um, the prosodic variations in indigenous communities, but speaking English. Um, so, <laughs> um, 
so the three areas, and really the fourth is just the one I did, but I'll talk about in a minute. Um, the three areas are in Toledo, which is in the Northwest Territories, way in the north. Then you have the Standing Rock Sioux Reservation, and then the study at Dartmouth College. And we wanted to get these three studies because they're representative of people's home reservations as well as a university setting. So it shows that uh, geographical difference as well as that home setting as well as a more formal setting like a university, but is that shift occurring? And so this is a picture of the Dartmouth powwow. And during that study, um, one student noted, I think it has to do with your familiarity and whether or not they also speak the same way. Because there is a sort of pan-Indian dialect that exists that people who aren't native might not understand. Additionally, someone said, in an academic setting, I speak differently than I would in a casual setting. So I think my res comes out, my res accent, reservation accent comes out in casual settings. And another student said, I feel like I have to talk more better to non-natives because they have expectations about us. Back home, I tend to make more grammatical mistakes and I don't care how I talk back home. But here, I feel like I have to up my game and speak formally. And so looking this, at this in terms of prosody, um, you can see where um, in this prot uh, clip, a word like Thomas, this red box noting this stressed syllable, you would find that this uh, pitch track would peak as a high tone within that stressed syllable. Um, and a person who um, actually defies this is a character in this movie called Smoke Signals, as most Native people do um, know this film. Um, he is this uh, young man named Thomas Builds the Fire, and he speaks in this very prosodic way, or very uh, stereotypical prosodic way of how Native people would say, oh, that, that's what sounds Native to me. Um, and so. You see that high, uh, high star where the pitch track line is peaking, but actually that contoured pitch accent um, is actually peaking right outside of that stressed syllable. And so when you see that in a word like Thomas, you would expect someone to say Thomas, not Thomas, which is how people would understand that. And so prosody is understudied in Native American English, um, but there are studies like Penfield, Leap, and Lefkowitz um, that have taken on initial steps into understanding what that actually means. And it's asking, is it enregistered? Are, there, are they indexing certain Native identities through these prosodic features? And Lefkowitz in 2000 actually studied the Smoke Signals movie and looked at Thomas's speech patterns and looked at whether is he having those prosodic variations. Um, but it's not just limited to films. And as uh, Jim pointed out, it's more contemporary interactions with the uh, modern Native American communities. And so you get popular Native comedians um, or powwow announcers like Don Burnstick, where they're emceeing the powwow that's going on. And through a lot of this, they're joking. They're having a lot of these um, funny, informal um, speech patterns or comedical groups um, like the 1491s. And so our Native American English project looked at four areas, um, the contoured pitch accent, which we have termed the Thomas feature, um, a high falling syllable in utterance final position, high rise terminal or mid terminal, and lengthened utterance final syllables. And as we mentioned earlier, Cogshell did a uh, study on syllable timing, which we also found evidence um, in our study, but we chose to focus on the former four. And so for the methods of how we um, elicited this data within the three or four um, case, or case areas um, were through casual parties and other group settings. And so at Dartmouth College, we had a fry bread party. So my freshman year, when I first took a linguistics class, um, we actually were able to gather a bunch of Native students together um, in an informal settings. And we cooked fry bread because even though it has like this um, weird, uh, cloudy, uh, relationship with Native communities, fry bread is still a way that Native people come together. And so we cooked a bunch of fry bread and um, we had this informal session. And as well as at uh, Sitting Bull College on the Standing Rock Reservation, which is where Nicole did her research and uh, um, Kalina did hers in a casual setting at a barbecue in Toledo in the Northwest Territories. And so we're going to play some. Oh, wait. Where's this consortium at? Yeah, so you see in the quotes is where um, we're highlighting that uh, feature. Where are you getting a massage? Right here. From... Who's going to make some popcorn? I'm hungry. You can. Bye, Kat. You're sitting there. Don't be looking at this. Why is it ugly? I don't know. Look how cheeky. And then we have more from the fry bread party. You're right about <laughs> I told y'all last week. 
Oh my god! Around awesome. many farms, you can drive at night. Oh, and then one time you might get a cow or something. <laughs> and then the sand dunes like yeah. go over the fence, yeah. so all the livestock just walk across. We must have a cow one day. Res logic. What, what did y'all call yourselves? Ratchet? Ratchet? No, we didn't call ourselves <laughs> that. That's a. Do you want to make fry bread? Or we're like, oh, sure. Like more. You should be. Just kidding. Just really? Chill. JK! <laughs> Go talk to Renee. I know, it's so boring. Go talk to Renee, she probably knows Amy stuff. Witzel. What's wrong with Shiprock? I love Shiprock. All right, so in that, um, those recordings, um, within the Freibred recording, there were seven Native students that were present, primarily in the first year of college, and we were able to get about 44 minutes of um, chatting between us, and we did have a set of questions together. And there was a diversity of tribal groups, whether that was Cherokee, Creek, Acoma Pueblo, Iowa, and they came from very geographically diverse areas, such as Oklahoma, Michigan, or New York. And within this Firebird recording, we were able to find um, a total of 772 utterances. And within that, um, we identified 185 native sounding prosodic features. Um, and then breakdown of 22 of the first, eight of the second, 39 of the third, 48 of the fourth, and 55 of the fifth. And within these native sounding features, they mostly came up in the context of when someone was joking, storytelling, um, having ironic imi imitations, expressing offense or solidarity. And we can think of this in terms of Kuplin's focus on what people meaningfully achieve through linguistic variation or what Silverstein talks about in terms of orders of indexicality. And so this is a uh, transcript excerpt of that conversation and it's talking about students and we ask them where they come from and someone talks about um, Shiprock and then some student uh, jokes about them and so you heard that earlier talking about Shiprock and so here's um, a sketch of that high utterance final position. Today. What's wrong with Shiprock? I love Shiprock. And so if we uh, look at all three locations together, we find all those tokens. That red line um, is the most significant piece, and it's showing that Thomas contoured pitch accent feature. Um, you see that nice spread across. But if you actually break it down in all three areas, you find consistent patterns within that feature. Um, and then the fourth area, which is my own research, which is why I went back to my own high school in Mesa, Arizona, and I looked at the research question, how do native teenagers in Arizona use language to express their ethnic identity. And I wanted to model this sort of out of um, Penelope Eckert's study on a Michigan high school where she looked at the difference between burnouts and jocks and sort of how do they understand their social identity within this context. And so I wanted to apply something similar to my own high school but sort of looking at indigenous people. And so how I undertook this was I looked at first an in individual interviews and I had this uh, survey and it had a list of questions asking students um, how they sort of like understand their identity as a native person. But a lot of the responses I got um, were very short or they tended to repeat the question within the answer and so wasn't really getting that uh, free speech that I was looking for. And so I went back and looked at um, a group discussion. So I wanted to maybe, uh, I have researcher bias and maybe I am seen as this authoritative figure in front of them and so maybe I need to bring in a group together. And so I brought in a group and we did the sample questions again. Um, but um, like the individual interviews, they also didn't really elicit any data. And so I actually went back again and changed my uh, methods. And so I actually completely removed myself um, from that environment and I just left a recorder. And as teenagers, we all love pizza. And so I bought them pizza and <laughs> I brought in some games for them to play. And I just left the recorder there and I said, have fun and I'll see you guys in about half hour, 45 minutes. And within that, um, I was able to find um, examples of the contoured pitch accent feature as well as a mid falling terminal and syllable timing. But what's really unique about it is that, um, I'll just go ahead and read it. Um, so student B says, they just get that accent again. And then C, like in what's that called, uh, smoke signals when they're talking to it in the car. B, yeah, they talk like that. My dad does this too, like when he's around his mom, he likes talks all weird in a way. He talks different. He like uh, changes the tone in his voice. Like he doesn't say full sentences. He just like makes them like, like they shorten them, but they still knows what they're saying or he's saying, I don't know, something like that. And so in conclusion, you can see, um, I was able to see that these students do understand um, or recognize what these native sounding features are, but they do attempt to 
distance themselves from it because they're trying to create this duality of, hey, I'm from a city, I don't speak like that because that's res talk. But what is that res talk? And at the same time, when I noted in the free speech patterns, they actually were active participants in using these prosodic features, even though they might not have known it. And that can sort of signal a um, shared ethnic identity. And so in summation of this project, we um, are showing that some Native people are creatively and resiliently using a foreign language like English for the linguistic construction of shared ethnic identities. And that can be used to counter the assimilation efforts of the past as well as build modern Native American identities. And, and one, of the, one of the things that was really interesting to me is one of, one of the students uh, that helped write up this paper pointed out that she was saying that they're actually using a foreign language, English, in a way that counters the assimilation efforts of the past. So it's kind of like turn, turning that around back toward the, the, the oppressive language is actually the one that's being used to create the identity that was trying to be stamped out in the first place. So we've looked at social meanings of prosodic variation in these three lesser studied communities with the Sui of China and lexical tone and Hmong American communities in terms of that uh, authoritative voice increased style, uh, pitch and intensity style, and then the Native American communities with these intonation patterns. And like I said, we're coming from a sociolinguistics point of view, but this is a really wonderful opportunity for us to get some of the expertise, both from sociolinguists here, but also from the phonologists and experts on prosody. So we'd welcome your comments and advice on that. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, so I had, a, I had a comment and a question. Well, first of all, uh, thanks for giving me this information. It's absolutely representative of my friends and colleagues in the Seneca community in Buffalo. Uh, I, I've been able to find lexical items like ace and fierce. These words, they've, I was already able to capture, but not this. I mean, I, I knew it, but I didn't have words for it. So I really want to thank you for pointing that out. Um, the question I have is with, the, with, the, with your experiment or with your study at the high school, I was wondering the, the, the student body and how, how much of the population there was native yeah. and not native. Yeah, so um, the native population within Mesa, Arizona, so it actually borders a reservation called Salt River. Um, and there are a lot of Navajo people that actually move from the reservation down into the urban, um, er urban areas. Um, and so at my high school in particular, there's about a 10% student population. Um, but I was only able to get about 20 to 25 par participants within my study, um, just because whenever I would give the survey or um, the consent form to the students, they tended to not return it. <laughs> um, so I had to work with what I had, but there was about a 10% um, student population. And a lot of them did note that they tended to feel more comfortable and change the way they speak around the natives, um, the natives in the school versus non-natives. Um, so I, oh, I'm Dominique, I'm from University of Michigan. Um, I had a question, so you were saying that you kind of based the high school study on the jocks and burnouts uh, that Eckert did, and I was wondering if you were planning on doing some sort of comparison uh, with another community to see, um, like another high school community to see if there's, like, um, if they're doing anything different from the students you observed. Yeah, Yeah. Um, I would like to look at the difference of whether a student population only has a few native students and sort of like are they more assimilating to the non-native student culture versus one that has a significant native population. And that's something I didn't consider when um, undertaking this study, but it is a good question for future like considerations. Thank you. Hi, uh, Ziel from UCLA. Um, I'm from Tucson, uh, and I thought that this was really interesting because I've actually heard one of these things uh, in my high school, 
um, which as far as I know has very little uh, native presence. Um, and so I think it'd be really cool if you were to uh, take a look at how maybe this might have spread uh, among people in Arizona. Uh, in particular, I, I remember uh, a lot of my Hispanic friends um, saying things like, no manchas, with especially especially mm. that high terminal there. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Go ahead. Yeah, that's something that um, is also very significant, especially within my high school. Is in addition to the native um, population, there's also a significant amount of the Latinx community um, at my high school, um, and there's a lot of. Uh, um, a lot of relationships between natives and the Latinx community, so I can see that shift because when natives do see something that is representative of their community, they want to share that with everyone. And so I can see those interactions um, playing out, and especially as Arizona having a significant indigenous population, that can see that um, cross uh, interactions between different ethnicities or identities spreading through. So yeah, but that'd be interesting to look at as well. Thank you. And of course, there's only a limited number of things that F-Zero can do, so we wouldn't be just claiming that this contour is only distinctive to one particular community, but we've just noticed that this is how this community uses it. So it certainly could be used by other communities, even with outside of contact, although that case looks like it might be contact. I'm Jonathan from the University of Oregon. Um, I also work with Native American groups in um, in Oregon. And one question I've had is about amplitude um, intensity differences. Um, and have you noticed this with intonation patterns or looked at it um, alongside of F0? Are, are you referring to the, the study with, um, the, with the Native American communities? Yes. Uh, no, we haven't, we, haven't, we haven't looked for intonation, for amplitude changes as a possibility. Do you, do you find any difference in, is there, is there a change in the just like general levels of of loudness in this, or do you think it's mainly about pitch? Yeah, I don't think there's really any differences in terms of amplitude, um, but really, uh, it, it is related more to the pitch. Like, Native women tend to, like, when they joke and have these informal settings, they are tend to be louder. That doesn't mean that they're changing necessarily, like, anything difference within the amplitude of that, um, but it is related more in terms of the pitch is what I found. Thanks. But maybe it is part of a general style. I don't know. It'd be something to check into for sure. 